All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the channel. Uh, today we're very excited to present our fundamental framework for e-bike features. This is a, you know, this is five industry secrets that are going to help you get fully educated about electric bikes in only about 25 minutes. Um, this is something that took me years to learn and practice explaining over and over on a daily basis. Um, I remember when I first started with electric bikes and the, the mid drives first came out, I was so new to them, trying to learn the technology, didn't have it fully you know, uh, wrapped around, didn't have my brain fully wrapped around it or understand it. And so I remember some of the, the weird analogies and, and bad analogies that I used to try and describe to customers what the difference between um, the different types of motors were. Uh, you know, that, that was really the electric portion of the bike. And then uh, back in the days when I was working on pedal bikes, uh, with pedal bikes, the when I would try and describe what the different frame geometries meant and, and what it was going to give to the customer, um, it, you know, it, it's taken me years to try and distill all the information that's out there um, about e-bikes into this simple uh, five-step process that's going to enable you to, to fully comprehend um, all the different features of e-bikes and more importantly what the benefits are of those features because that's really the in, important part here. Um, it's not which e-bikes have what, it's what features give you what experience. Um, the best electric bike is only the best bike if it's best for you. And so understanding what the benefits of the features of an electric bike are is going to be the first step to identify what is the best electric bike for you. So helping get educated about what different bikes offer and what's available out there on the market right now. The second step, which is going to be the next video, and I'll link a, a post to it here in the description, is going to be your rider profile. So generating your rider profile. What benefits are you looking for? How are you expecting or how are you, excuse me, wanting to use the electric bike? That's going to be the, the second part of this equation. But first we need to, to dive in and figure out what is available from electric bikes and what benefits they're going to give you. So let's jump in. All right, so just a quick overview of what we're going to go through today. Um, number one, we're going to look at the different types of motors. So there's two fundamental different types of motors that are going to give you a completely different experience of what an electric bike is. 95% of riders fall into one category or the other, really quickly able to figure out which type of motor it is that you're looking for. Number two is going to be talking about the, the different geometries of bicycles. So that's going to give you a different posture, um, and it's going to give you different comfort levels. It's going to give you different intended uses. Um, so that's definitely an important one from a base bicycle point of view to go through. Number three is we're going to go through the different frame styles. So step overs, step throughs, low steps. What do all those mean and what are the benefits uh, to you of one or the other? What are the different brake systems available on bikes? This is a huge point. Um, it has to do with you know, how much maintenance you're expected to do on the bicycle. What is the braking performance and what are the braking the uh, service intervals, the length of time you can go before getting uh, your brakes adjusted and your bike tuned up. And then lastly, number five is going to be what price range and, and what quality range um, are there available and which what do each category give to you in terms of benefits. So that's again going to have to do with how much maintenance, uh, what kind of performance you want, what kind of battery and, and range you can expect, all that plays into that category. All right, so let's dive further into each group now. Um, number one, we're going to talk about the different types of motors. This is how I start every single conversation um, with people that come to our, our bike shop in, in person. Um, and this is a, I've had to explain this so many times and 
only in the last, you know, year have I really started to distill it into a very easy to comprehend um, manner. Before I would use all these weird analogies that some people got, most people didn't, it was a, a mess. So um, there are two different types of motors. There is a rear hub motor, and that's going to give you a lot of raw power. It's going to allow you to get a lot of power out of the bicycle while putting relatively little in yourself if that's what you're looking to do. It's going to allow you to ride that bike 100% electric assist using nothing but a throttle. And it's going to have pedal assist. And the pedal assist levels, each one is going to take you faster and faster regardless of how hard you're pedaling. So if you have that baby up in pedal assist level 5 and only pedal very lightly, it'll still take you uh, 20 or 24 miles, 28 miles per hour depending on the strength of the motor. The other completely different type of electric bike is a mid-drive motor when the motor is in the middle of the pedals in the, in the crank. That is going to give you an authentic cycling experience. Those motors are going to take your input, they're going to monitor how hard you're pedaling and give you power back in relation to that. Now, the pedal assist levels, each one is going to give you more power back. But even if you're at the highest pedal assist level and only putting in very little amount of energy, you're not going to get much back. It's not going to do all the work for you. Now, the neat thing about it is it's a much more refined pedal assist. It feels more like a regular pedal bike experience. With the rear hub motors, you're keeping up with the, the motor when you're pedaling. It, it's like the motor is doing a certain amount of work, and then you're either just keeping up without doing any pressure at all, or you're adding pressure on top of the motor. The mid-drive motors are going to allow you to do the work first, and then give you power back in relation to that. It monitors at an incredible rate of a thousand times per second and outputs energy at the same rate and there's zero latency. So the millisecond that you start and the millisecond that you stop and everywhere in between it's monitoring and giving you a constant percentage back of your power input. So at pedal assist level one for instance it might give you 40 or 45 percent depending on the motor back of what you're putting in. So you're pedaling first, that's the first action, and then it's giving you power back on top of that. With the rear hub type motor, the motor is giving you power first, and then you're kind of pedaling on top of it. What's different, and the different experience, you know, is, is the mid-drive motor really gives you that authentic cycling experience because you are just pedaling. It's just amplifying your pedal stroke. It's making what you do more powerful stronger to allow you to pedal up hills easier um, and go further distances while still getting you know a, a, a bicycle exercise workout. The rear hub motors is a real recreational use. It's got a lot of raw power and it's gonna blow you away. I was I was shocked with how much power it had when I first got on it. Uh, very impressed. It's going to be more difficult to get a regular pedal bike experience and get that that motion of pushing on the pedals uh, from the rear hub type. You know, I hear all the time people say, well, they both have pedal assist. Why would I go with the one that doesn't have a throttle, the mid-drive? A mid-drive motor will never have a throttle. And I hear everybody going, well, wait, I've, I've seen the mid-drive motors with it. So I'll dig just a level deeper into the different types of motors. Truly, there are only two different types of motors. There is a cadence sensing motor and a torque sensing motor. A torque sensing motor can exist in the rear hub or it can exist in the mid drive. A cadence sensing motor can exist in the rear hub or in the mid drive. The cadence sensing motor is what I ex was explaining when I said the rear hub motor. It is a lot of raw power. That can exist in the, in the mid drive. Um, Buffang systems will use that. like some of the um, conversion kits and that will get you a throttle. Don't let that fool you thinking that it's a mid-drive and so then you're going to get that authentic cycling experience because that motor is still just going to give you more power each time you put up the pedal assist level. 
it's going to give you the power and then you're going to be pedaling on top of it or trying to keep up to it. The torque sensing motors, which mostly exist in the mid drives, are made by either Bosch, Yamaha, Rose, or Shimano. Those are the only true torque sensing motors available on stock electric bikes. And those are the ones that are going to give you that authentic cycling experience. So yes, when I describe it with the rear hub versus the, the mid drive and say those two different benefits, there are exceptions. 98% of bicycles out there, if the motor is in the rear wheel, it's that raw power, recreational fun. If it's in the middle of the frame, it's that authentic cycling experience. So yes, there are exceptions. Don't let that confuse you. The last thing about mid-drive motors um, is that, technically speaking, they are more efficient. Now why is that? It's because the motor actually turns forward the drivetrain, your gears, the mechanical components. The motor drives forward just like your pedaling does. And so when you adjust, change the mechanical gear on the bicycle, it adjusts the load that the motor is experiencing, just the same way it does for your legs. So you know you're pedaling along and you're hitting a hill, you can downshift your mechanical gears to make it easier to pedal. Well, that same thing is happening for the motor. So it's like having an external transmission on the bicycle. That's the advantage of having gears. And the motor on a mid-drive motor gets to use that mechanical advantage as well. And so it is a much more efficient system. Whereas the rear hub motor is more like a single speed. Now, if it's a geared hub motor, then it has three internal gears in it. Um, and so it's able to operate, but it's only three gears as opposed to, you know, even an absolute minimum uh, bike will have seven mechanical gears. So it's still less than what the mid drive has available to it. Um, and so more power from the rear hub is required because it's doing more work turning forward that rear wheel. Now, who would appreciate one of the motors or, or the other? Now, what we see with the mid-drive motors are typically customers who are already pedal biking or who have pedal biked a lot in their past and haven't been doing it for a little bit, but are looking to get that uh, authentic cycling experience back into their lives. Um, we also sometimes see riders who are very cautious and haven't been on a bike for a very long period of time and are... Um, worried and um, thrown off by the amount of raw power that the rear hub have, especially lighter, um, lighter women riders sometimes um, who are a little bit nervous to get on an electric bike. The, the mid-drive has been the way to go because it is like a regular pedal bike experience, just as if you were stronger. The rear hub motors are great for our recreational riders, people who are looking just have a lot of raw fun, um, get out there and, and maybe run a couple errands, but mostly are using it to, you know, go to the beach or, or just as, a, as an activity to do with their friends and family. All right, moving on to number two, we've got different frame geometries. Now, I'm going to put the two different types on a spectrum here, and we're going to start with a beach cruiser geometry. Now what is this? It is a really relaxed seat tube angle. So if you look at the where the seat attaches to the frame, you'll see it's on an angle something like this. Your butt's up here and the pedals are down here. And so you're pedaling out in front of you. That extends the wheelbase. It makes it a longer wheelbase and a longer bicycle. Because those pedals are pushed out in front of you, they have to make the space for that. So often you'll see the bars that wrap back towards you because when you're sitting on that and pedaling forward, the bars need to wrap back towards you so that you can be in that nice upright riding posture. You should be in a completely upright posture and then your pedals, your, your legs should be pedaling forward something like that. It's kind of like sitting on a sofa. That's what I, I um, attribute it to. So, it is the most initially comfortable riding posture. If you're just going on shorter rides, um, definitely, you know, if you're looking for comfort, that's the way to go. For longer rides, an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, 
just like sitting on a really comfortable sofa, you know, you start moving around, you start not having that essential fundamental support um, for your body that, that you, would, you would want to have. So on the other side of the spectrum, we have what I would call hybrid bicycles uh, or road bikes. Mountain bikes fall into this category as well, where the seat tube angle is much more vertical, something like this. And so you're, um, you're sitting right on top of the pedals and pedaling directly down. The intended purpose behind that from the pedal bike point of view was so that your legs could be like this, your upper body could be leaned forward. And now what's, what's happening is that you're able to create more pressure on your core. You're able to engage your core more, which allows you to generate more power with your legs. Now, with the e-bikes, one of the things that we, we like to be able to do is to make more concessions for comfort. Because we have the support of the motor, we're not required and responsible for generating 100% of the power that goes into the bike. So making concessions for comfort is, is definitely the trend that we've seen with electric bikes. So even the hybrid bicycles in the electric bikes are going to have concessions for comfort. Almost no bikes are going to be, you know, seat and handlebars on the same level. Even a hybrid bicycle where you're pedaling directly down, the handlebars are still going to be quite higher than the saddle. So not as much as a beach cruiser maybe. You know, the beach cruiser will be even up and then the bars come back to so put you really in that upright riding posture and take all the weight off the front wheel. So it gives you that beach cruiser sensation. A lot of folks who have ridden a bike um, previously in the past that uh, was a hybrid or a road bike or a mountain bike might still appreciate the riding posture of the more hybrid style with the vertical seat tube angle um, because the wheelbase is going to be shorter. The handlebars are going to be flat because you haven't thrown your seat way back which makes the handlebars have to come back. You're going to still be up like this so the handlebars can stay out right on the front wheel. And that's going to put a little bit more pressure, maybe not pressure, but it's going to give you more control over the front wheel. So handling on a bike like that is going to feel much more like a regular hybrid bicycle. Um, and it's going to give you the same kind of ride quality. So if you're already comfortable with a, a, a beach cruiser, you're more than, I, I would suggest sticking with that. If you are used to riding a regular pedal bike, like a hybrid or a mountain bike, I would suggest getting one with the vertical seat tube angle, but looking for one where um, the handlebars are quite a bit higher than the saddle. That's going to allow you to sit still in a nice upright riding posture, but get that same kind of feeling of riding a bicycle, which is important. All right, so number three, we've got uh, the different frame styles. This will be a nice quick one. Um, you know, there's the step over frames, there's a step through, and then a low step. Um, as you increase the amount of step through, you're going to decrease the tensile, tensile integrity of the bicycle. So there's going to introduce more flex and, and more um, you know, risk of the bike not being able to support substantial weight. So for our riders that are heavier, um, you know, 200 and 20, 230 pounds and up, I'd definitely recommend a step over. Um, for our riders who are, um, you know, more aggressive, uh, who are going to be riding the bikes off-road um, or harder and, and faster, I would recommend a step over as well. Now, the step through and the low step, um, you know, the low step is still going to be quite strong. I don't think any of our riders are going to experience the um, frame flex that's going to be introduced from a low step versus a high step. So if you are looking for something a little bit more approachable, you can go with the low step. The true step through that wave um, frame shape is going to be great for any of our older riders who have an issue throwing a hip and leg over the back of the seat. And for our, our more um, lighter riders, more petite riders, shorter riders, and also for um, are just casual recreational users. So the ability to just step through the frame and onto the saddle is so nice. 
especially if you're going to load that bike up with a basket on the back or a bag, which is what 90% of our customers do is, is find a way to haul some, some load because you know, you're able to do so much more on the electric bike. You don't have to worry about adding weight onto it. So if you plan on putting a basket on the back or a bag, keep that in mind because you won't be able to swing your leg up and over that. Um, and so you'll want to get a step through where you can easily step through the frame and up onto the, the seat. So this is a really important one, number four, the different braking systems. Um, there's two different types of disc brakes. There are mechanical disc brakes and hydraulic disc brakes. The difference between them is that the mechanical disc brakes use a cable to pull the brake. At the caliper, where the actual braking is occurring, what's going on is with the mechanical disc brake, the inboard pad, the one on the inside of the bike, is stationary. That's set. And then the outboard pad is what is compressing when you apply braking force at the lever up at the handlebar. When you do that, the pad, the outboard pad, moves over, hits the disc brake rotor, and pushes it over against the inboard pad. As opposed to hydraulic disc brakes, which we have in our vehicles and motorcycles and things like that, it uses a hydraulic fluid, a mineral oil. And what happens when you activate the brake at the lever on the handlebar is that both pads move together to sandwich the rotor in between and provide equal braking force on either side. So that's the fundamental difference. Now, the mechanical disc brakes are harder to create braking force. You're, using, you're having to create all the braking force yourself with your hand, um, whereas the hydraulic brakes, using that fluid, the fluid is actually pushing, um, so the braking force is much greater it's a lot easier. You're, you're essentially having a uh, power braking system in your vehicle. You're just activating the brake by hitting the lever and then the fluid is doing the work to create the braking force and because both pads are hitting equally more force is also created. The mechanical pull, you're pulling and you're pulling on that lever and so then that pulling activates that brake pad and only one side hits initially until you can push with using the force of your fingers that rotor over to sandwich the uh, inboard pad. So braking performance is definitely improved with hydraulic disc brakes. The other thing that's also really improved with hydraulic disc brakes is the length of service interval. So how many miles can you ride in between having your brakes adjusted? So because that inboard pad is stationary on the mechanical brake, and only the outboard pad is moving from, the, the, uh, from activating the lever. What happens when it, when it hits and pushes it over to compress, obviously some material from the brake pad wears off each time. But because the distance between the inboard and the rotor is set, as the, the pad wears down, there's more space, which means that you have to pull further to get the, the braking power to happen. The same thing is happening with the outboard pad. When you let go, it, remove, it returns to its resting position. And that resting position is set by the, the tension of the cable, excuse me. And unless you're used to retensioning that cable all the time, then also on the outboard pad, more space is created. So then you ha it takes you longer, it takes you it requires you to you pull that lever further to create the braking power. So what will happen is every 90 miles, what's going to happen with the mechanical disc brakes is that the handle will pull all the way back, the lever, excuse me, will pull all the way back to the handle, and you won't be able to create any braking force. So every 90 miles is the service interval for mechanical disc brakes. Hydraulic disc brakes, because the fluid in there, what's actually happening is the resting position when you let go of the lever it's not um, it's created by force how much braking force is occurring so when they move apart they move to a new position each time 
And as you, you wear down the brake pad, it doesn't move back as far. And so you're always getting the same braking performance and the same tension um, on the, the brake lever until those pads are completely worn out. And then at that point, you have to replace the brake pads. Depending on rider weight, speed, and all that, service interval on those can be between three and up to 600 miles. We say 500 miles is the average. So keep that in mind. You know, you're going to have to maintain mechanical disc brakes five times as much as hydraulic disc brakes. Now, if you're comfortable, there's a very easy way to readjust using the barrel adjuster, it's called, the, the cable tension on a mechanical. But that's only going to get you to 200 mile service interval. At 200 mile, that barrel adjuster will be tapped out and you'll have to reset the brake up at the caliper. Now, that is a difficult process because every time you've braked, you've, you've hit the rotor and then you've bent it over. And so now the rotor, instead of being dead straight, is kind of fluttering like this. And so to be able to get the caliper reset so that the pads are close enough that you're getting nice braking power, but not so close that the rotor isn't hitting it every revolution and you're getting that whoosh, 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 um, sound on, on every rotation of the wheel. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, conceptually, it's easy. I can explain you how to do it. But the actual ability to see in there and the tension and know which one to adjust, it's a little bit of an art form, which you know I've taught many people how to do it. And even a really mechanically proficient person, I'm thinking of the most recent um, mechanic we trained, took him four, five, six months of full-time work at a, at a bicycle shop to be able to really feel comfortable with the ability to do it. And still there's a lot that, you know, just are, are a mess right out of the box with some of the more inexpensive electric bikes. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. All right, and then the last one, number five, um, the different price ranges is going to indicate what kind of quality you can expect. Um, we don't even look at anything underneath $1,000. And I'm sorry if there's, there's some viewers out there who are interested in, in you know, looking at bikes under $1,000. In my opinion, it's, it's too much of a gamble. It's not something I can safely recommend to any of my consumers uh, or customers, excuse me, because it's, it's a risk. It's a gamble. When that bike gets to you, there is a 60 to 40% chance that something is going to be broken right out of the gate. And on bikes under $1,000, there's no customer service. There's often no return policy. Um, I've seen just horror stories of bikes um, you know, that were broken out of the, the box and people were unable to even get anybody on the uh, an email or phone. And when they did, you know, they gave them these back end stories about how they were going to lose their job if you returned it and all this kind of weird stuff. It, it happens on, on the forums um, of e-biking community all the time. So under $1,000, I stay away from, never recommend it personally. So uh, the $1,000 to $1,500 range you know, this is going to be great for our customers who are interested in getting into electric bikes, but they're not sure if it's going to be something that they really pick up. Um, they're just interested in trying it out and not putting too much money down. Now, at that price point, you are going to have to make some concessions, first of all. If you want to get, you know, a good mechanical quality bike, you're going to have to give up the battery power and the battery range. Um, if you want uh, a good electrical system at that price point, you're going to have to give up a good mechanical quality bicycle. So there's going to be some trade-off um, there. You're never going to get uh, a really good electric bike at that price point. And the unfortunate thing is, is if you make the wrong trade-off, you know, you're not sure what, benef what feature gives what benefit and you haven't considered for yourself, which we're going to do in the next video, what benefits you want, and you make that wrong trade-off, you know, you wanted a really strong bike, didn't really care about the mechanical components, and you got a really weak bike with strong mechanical components, then it could prevent you from getting into electric bikes at that price point. At the $1,500 to $2,000 price point, you know, this is for our customers who are wanting to be thrifty and still know that they're going to get into electric bikes. 
you can most likely get 80, 75% or 80% of the benefits that you'd want out of an electric bike at that price point. Um, it's not going to prevent you from getting into electric bikes. You know, it's going to give you enough power and good enough mechanical components. Um, so it, that's a good value price point, in my opinion. The $2,000 and up, you know, this is where we're really getting into 90, 95% of the benefits that you'd appreciate in an electric bike. Um, it's going to have very long service intervals, it's going to be very reliable. And more than that, at that price point, the riding profile, that almost intangible ride quality aspect, how does it feel to sit on the bicycle? What is the riding experience is going to be thought of? It's going to be tried and it's going to be adjusted, redesigned, and then rebuilt. Um, after a testing period. So you're going to get a much better riding quality bicycle. The mechanical components and the electrical components are both going to be good on a bike that's over $2,000. So that's it's kind of the different um, price and quality aspects. Now, when it comes to the different power and battery range, battery range on a mid-drive motor is going to be very long. No matter what size battery you get, you know, you could get a um, 400 watt hour battery pack, it's called, and that's equivalent to like a, you know, nine amp hours. And the bike will still take you 45 or 55 miles on a single charge. 500 watt hour battery pack, it's going to take you 60, 65. The reason because, it, the reason it is, is because the power is only giving you power back in relation to what you're doing. So it's a much more efficient system. The rear hub motors are going to need to have more raw power, you know, because they don't have the mechanical gears to, to help um, adjust the load that the motor is experiencing. It has to have more raw power, thus it's going to suck more juice from the battery. Your t traditional battery, your, your standard battery is going to be 14 amp hours. Um, and that's going to get you, depending on how you're riding, you know, just a completely average number here is going to be 35 to 45 miles on that um, bike. Now, if you go with more power, then that battery is going to suck more. If you use the throttle more, that battery is going to draw more, and you're going to get less range. A 21 amp hour battery will typically see with a more powerful bicycle, like a um, you know 750 or 1,000 watt motor, and that is going to give you just a little bit more range, but not much because more power is, is being asked of it. Now, if you use a 1,000 watt motor with a 21 amp hour battery, but only use it you know, at 10, 15 miles per hour, then you will get a, a huge extra range. But if you're trying to travel over 22, 23 miles per hour, there's a very significant wind barrier that occurs at that that speed that it takes exponentially more power to get over that that barrier and go faster than that. So a battery is really going to draw quickly if you're constantly traveling pedal assist 5, pedal assist 6, uh, and over 22, 23, 24 miles per hour. So be cautious of that. At the $2,000 price range, almost none of our customers are um, limited by the battery. It's you know, you, you're getting a long enough range battery at that price point. And nearly none of our customers in any price range are limited when they have the mid-drive motor because they're required to do a little bit more of the work. The motor is much more efficient because you're able to adjust the load that the motor's experiencing and it's giving you more power, or uh, it's giving you more range, excuse me. All right, everyone, that's gonna do it for the framework, the, the fundamental features framework of the bike. Now I know it's a lot of information and um, you know I'm going to be posting more videos on each one specifically really diving more into the uh, details of it and feel free to post any questions. I'm more than happy to try and help you understand these concepts. Um, you know it's it's something that you can definitely get your head around. Um, you know you might think Oh, this guy's been doing it for so long, you know, it's easy for him to say that. The reality is, is I've walked so many um, customers through this that by the end, you know, they fully understand these concepts just after uh, a 30 to 45 minute 
you know, shopping consultation. Uh, my favorite story is a, a customer named Bill. Um, you know, he's a 65-year-old retired man, um, and he came in looking for an electric bike. Uh, and I walked him through this process just the same way that I did for you, uh, you know, and then combined it with the, the next video that we're going to do, which is the rider profile. We found a perfect electric bike for him. And what was so great is Bill then turned around and used this framework, and he ended up selling, in the end, it was six of his friends, his wife, uh, his best friend, um, one of his friends and her wife, uh, and um, oh, his best friend's brother. He ended up selling six electric bikes um, using the exact same framework. So this isn't something that you know is impossible to learn or wrap your head around. Once you do wrap your head around, you can be like Bill and turn around and you know use it on yourself to make sure that you get the right electric bike. Um, that's going to allow you to become an electric bike rider and it's going to allow you to change your lifestyle and get out there and start enjoying your life too because that's what Bill's doing with all of his you know, riding partners. Um, they, they ride frequently to the point where you know, Bill was such a regular customer that he'd keep coming back and he's such a nice friendly guy. You know, This summer came this summer and we actually ended up uh, bringing him on a couple days a week um, with everything that's happened in the bike industry, you know, it's just insane. Bill has sold more bikes than anybody else that's ever worked in our bike shop. Now, using this exact same framework, he sold 50 bikes in a single pay period, which is two weeks. He sold 50 electric bikes using this exact same framework. It took him one time to learn on a one-on-one -on -one basis where I was able to point him, he was able to ask questions. So it might take us a little bit longer to get there through this medium. I just I know that we're going to be able to get there, though. Just feel free to ask any questions. Um, and like I said, I'm going to post more videos going forward based on your guys' questions about what are the, 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 the topics here that are more challenging uh, to wrap your head around and explain. As I develop my ability to teach through this medium as well, um, you know, I'll, I'll upgrade the video uh, further along with different examples and, and you know different props and things like that so but I just want you to know that it definitely is possible for you to wrap your head around this concept all right guys thank you so much for for joining me um, it was a long one today uh, so happy we got through this this is the first part of educating yourself about electric bikes this is all you need to know I promise you about the different types of electric bikes um, I get some really common questions that I'll follow up with here, but the, the next point to go into is the rider profile. So please join us for the next video and we'll run through that and I'll talk about how to join them both together to find the best, to fully educate you on electric bikes and find the best one for you so you can get out there and start enjoying your life too. All right, thanks so much guys.